Good morning, Lighthouse. Um, I wish I'd be with you this morning and with Brigitte, but as you know, uh, we got COVID and we have to keep our distance. We are very sad about this because we had so many uh, appointments and meetings with many of you. Uh, we were so happy and anticipating to be with you on Sunday and on Monday. And we don't know why these things happen, but it's the way it is. But I still have the privilege this morning to be with you uh, and share, uh, I hope, an encouraging message in the Word of the Lord. Hallelujah. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, this morning to awaken our spirit by your Holy Spirit, Lord. And thank you, God, for your presence and your blessing and your healing power that is with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. This week I've been uh, reading, and uh, this text said in Ecclesiastes in chapter 9, I reflected on all of this. So Solomon is thinking about life, and uh, he says, All the righteous and wise, everything they do is in God's hands. But no one knows whether love or hate awaits them. I have seen something else. The race is not to the swift. Battle is not to the strong. But time and chance happens to them all. No one knows when their hour will come. This is deep. And it, it uh, comes and uh, speaks to us this morning in a very special way. As I was thinking of uh, what's happening, uh, talking and hearing news of one and the other in Lighthouse, I know that sometimes uh, in life we encounter situations, uh, events, uh, dramatic situations. And uh, these things will bring crises into our life. They come with questions, they come and provoke inside of us inner conflicts and, and doubts. And I believe that uh, there are many of you here this morning that are going through this kind of situations in your life. Great setbacks, great time of questionings. And you are questioning yourself, you are questioning your future, and you are questioning God. So sh what should we do? with these? How do we go on living our life and our Christian life uh, when we go through periods like, like this? So uh, I want to begin this morning with a, a declaration of certainty, a text from the Bible that I've been uh, wanted to, to share with you this morning. It's, it's powerful. It's very powerful. Uh, it's a text from Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. It's a message, Paul says, that can be trusted. So let's trust the word of the Lord this morning. 1 Timothy 1, 15. This is a statement that can be trusted and deserves complete acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the first. I myself, I'm the first of them, depending on what Bible version we have. Paul considered himself like he has been one of the worst sinner ever. Verse 16, he continues in saying, However, I was treated with mercy so that Christ Jesus could use me, the foremost sinner, to demonstrate his patience. This patience serves as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. So we have here a glimpse of Paul's mind, a glimpse of Paul's testimony this morning. From verse 12 to 17 in that section, Paul offers uh, to us a glimpse of his own personal background. And then he will say in verse uh, 12, I thank God for appointed, appointing me in the ministry. Verse 13, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an arrogant man, and, but I obtained mercy and I acted in 
ignorantly and unbelief. He, he admit now that it was in ignorance. He did not believe, so it made him do things that he regretted later in life. In verse 14 he says, the grace of the Lord overflowed Wow, that's a, that's a big, big word here. Was exceeding abundant. First of all, we see in Paul's word a deep awareness and a great uh, thankfulness for being saved. That, that is something that he expressed. And I think this is something that throughout our life, we need to go back to uh, our testimony of the time of the grace of God when we repented, when God the Holy Spirit convicted us of sin and led us to Jesus Christ to take away our sins and give us a new life. We, we need to, to tell our story because every time you tell a story, you, you relive it and you, you go back to the cross. You go back to what you were and what you have become by the grace of the Lord. And, and it is it is soothing, it is, it is a healing moment. Every time you share your testimony and you relive what God has done for you, it builds up your faith. It gives us more confidence in, in the love of God for you and the grace of the Lord. And it tells you that God loves you so much that He gave you this new life. He's not going to abandon you now. One of my favorite verse in Romans 8, verse 32, he said, if God has not spared his own son, what he had most precious for us, will he not even more give us everything? So that, that answers all of our questions. The proof of the love of God at the cross by sacrificing his son for my sin and your sin is such a demonstration a convincing demonstration of God's love for you and me that it builds a foundation that we should never question, we should never doubt about the love of God. The love of God is our greatest assurance. It's our greatest motivation in life. It's what leads us to obey. It's what leads us to, to do good works. It's what leads us to, to answer God's call in our lives and do great things in the kingdom of the Lord. So Paul expresses deep awareness and his gratefulness for being saved. He says, I was treated for with mercy, but there's a purpose into that verse as well. He explained a little bit more deeply what was the purpose of God, and we will develop that a little bit more. He says, I was treated with mercy, even though he had been a blasphemer, persecutor, an arrogant man, he did many bad things that he regrets today. He says, I was treated with mercy so that Christ could use me. Wow, and that tells us something about our lives right now. You see, well, I'm not in a position to be used by God because right now I'm in the midst of my crisis. I'm in the midst of my disease. I'm in the midst of a, a personal inner struggling in my life. There's things in my life that doesn't go uh, as planned. All my plans has been uh, shattered through whatever happened to me through these events, these dramatic events that happened. No, that's not like this. Even in the midst of that crisis, God can use you because He is with you. God can use you because He will teach you how to go through, how to navigate that crisis uh, with His grace, with His peace, uh, with the, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. He, will, he, he has more grace for you for, for every day. And He will walk the path with you every single day. So that as you will go there, you will learn lessons, very valuable life lessons. And God will be able to use you during that crisis and after that crisis. That is something that I'm convinced of. He wants to use me. Also, he wants to show something uh, really important about his character. Here it talks about his patience. In the case of Paul, Paul says that uh, by saving Paul, Christ was showing off his patience. He has been patient. And I think we, call, we can all admit this morning 
that when we look at our past life and everything that we have done, that God has been greatly patient. And He is still patient uh, with us, if we want to be, uh, be honest. But as God moves into our life, He reveals His own nature and His own character to us. He says that to demonstrate His patience. And then the result of that is that this patience that God is showing to us will eventually serve as an example to those who surround us, to those who will witness our times of crisis, those who are observing our lives, those who are from our family, our colleagues, and people that surround, especially our children, the way Christian parents go through life and handle crisis, the children will learn about this more than anybody else and that will serve as an example. So I am convinced that the, the purpose that God has for saving you first and showing His patience to you was that eventually your, your life story and your salvation experience will gr gr glorify Him. It will be a, a demonstration of the power of God. It will be a, transform, uh, uh, a testimony to God's transforming power, what you were and what you have become. And even going through the, the tough crisis, the crisis where you think you have no more control on and that you, you don't know if you will even see the, the end of the tunnel, don't despair because God is going to use that crisis you know, I, I don't want to give you a cliche, but God works in all things so that those who love God will eventually come out stronger in that. And Roman, we, we have this, this verse that we often quote, and we often misquote that. But the, the fact is that in all of our crises, God will be working because He has a greater purpose. He has the purpose to transform us to the likeness of His Son, Jesus. And that is, I think, the ultimate goal of God. So do not be surprised, as we read at the beginning in Ecclesiastes, but no one knows whether love or hate awaits us. Um, but time and chance happen to them all. No one knows when their time will come. Uh, there are things in life we will not find out. There will not be an answer for all of our crises in our lives. But there are certain things that we can build our life upon. Even though we cannot answer all of the questions, there are certain things. And we just read one of these. This is a statement that can be trusted and deserves complete acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Romans 8, we have another certainty. And all the things God is working for the good of those who love God, because the ultimate purpose is eventually that all of these circumstances, positive and negative, will lead us eventually to become more conform to the likeness of His Son. And that's what God is trying to do in your life this morning and in, and in my life. Wow. Paul used uh, his testimony to bring that truth to us this morning. So 1 Timothy 1.15 again in the King James says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. A faithful, faithful saying means dependable. Some things that is worthy of full and universal acceptance. It, it, it can be applied in every country of the world. It can be accepted in every culture. That is the power of the gospel that we preach. Whether we are on the mountain with the Atas, it can be applied there. We can be in India, it can be applied there. It, we can be in North America or in Hong Kong or Singapore, it can be applied. That is the power of the gospel. A faithful and trustworthy saying. A trustworthy fact. It's not something uh, of imagination. It's not a dream. It's not a vision. It's a fact of life. A truth upon which we can build our life. You can build your life upon these things. These facts, these trustworthy saying, 
uh, w will stand the test of time. They will not diminish, they will not lose their flavor, they will not lose the essence of truth that he has. And these are reality given to us by God himself so that we can go on with our life regardless of the things that will happen in our life. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, uh, and, uh, another th truth that I want to bring to your attention this morning, Paul says, now the Spirit says clearly that in the last times, some will turn away. So here is a crossroad uh, in our lives. There are things that will happen in our lives. There are um, trends and cultures that will happen. There are directions that government takes, new laws, uh, uh, trends in so modern society, uh, opinions, philosophies of life, moralities that will take place in every generation. And in the last times it says that some will turn away. We come to crossroads when we go through crises and times. We, we are weak, we are questioning life, we are questioning ourselves, we don't know what to do, how to react to these things. There's a crossroads. We can turn away or make another kind of uh, decisions. And I want to propose to you another, another choice than turning away. It is also the spirit that says clearly to us. So that's something that we need to, to take to heart. It's not just a saying or me saying that. It's the Holy Spirit took the, the, the writer's heart to tell us clearly a message that we need to heed uh, this morning. So what does that mean to us, the church, or to us as individuals? Uh, we have an important role to play in our lives. Because since Christ chose us, at the same time, we are going through uh, valleys uh, and uh, ravines and peaks sometimes of difficult times. And then at that time, we also have a role to play. God gives you eventually a, a role of influence, a, an opportunity to witness, an opportunity to demonstrate the character of God. Uh, in, and through your, your life. How do we become effective influencers? But how can you and me become effective influencers? Uh, so w we have another text in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 that I want to read to you. Keep yourselves in training for a godly life. Physical exercise has little value but spiritual exercises is valuable in every way because it is holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. In verse 9, this saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. Again, one of these powerful saying, the saying of a certainty. For to this end, we both labor and strive because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially to those who believe. So, again, we have this powerful text from Paul that will tell us some basic principle how you and I, through, as we live our, our daily life, we, come, we can become uh, powerful influencers in our modern society. The first thing is train yourself uh, to godliness, to a godly life. Discipline yourself to a godly life. Make yourself disciplined. You know, we have the decisions to make uh, uh, every day. Um, we, we need to increase in that, become stronger, more devout to these things. Keep yourselves in training. It's like you will use an illustration in these verses, the illustrations of athletes. So it says to us, when it comes to our spiritual life, our values, our reading, our faith, and all of these things, he will say to us, keep yourself in that state of mind of like an athlete of training uh, yourself. So in, verse, uh, in the, this context here, uh, Paul encouraged Timothy and other Christians to pursue these sorts of training, spiritual training. This is a process. 
This is critical for powerful growth, for your growth and for the growth of the church. Here is a comp comparison. Uh, one is good, the other one is better. Bodily fitness has a small degree of benefits because it's, it's light, it's slight in time of, of term and importance when you consider eternity. But uh, training in godliness is valuable in all sorts of profits. Strive for godliness. Invest yourself and you, to your spiritual life. Even though you go through a big time of crisis, even though uh, you, your life came to a, a, a stop, even though you, you, you have encountered a setback, listen to that. Strive for godliness. Keep that uh, inflow of the life of God in, in you. This, this training, this moving forward, this desire, this personal discipline, this desire to grow in the Lord, keep it alive. Live like God wants you to do because it has benefits. It has benefits right now, every day that you will live. You will live better, you will live happier, you will live stronger. I'm thinking about the heroes of the faith. They were heroes not because of their perfection in life. They were heroes because of their faith, because of their continued holding on to God, because they persevered to walk with the Lord. They were committed to the Lord, so they became our, our heroes. They are listed for their faith. They went through great setbacks and crises. And Hebrew chapter 11, verse 2, this says, because they had this sorts of faith that is defined in Hebrew 11, 1. It says in verse 2, it says, because of this sorts of faith that they had, they have received a good report from the Lord himself. God himself commanded their faith. He gave us to read about their faith. And this is so, so important. They, great, they were great influencers. They were great influencers. So, how to be an influencer? There are things that we must insist upon. Uh, Paul, talking to Timothy, says, Be an example to all believers in what you see, the way you live, and faith, and love, and everything. So he lists a lot of things, and your purity. Turn your mind, pay attention, and apply yourself to reading, encouragement, and teaching. Don't neglect your spiritual gift. Don't stop serving. God has equipped you with spiritual gift. You are good in something. Use it for the Lord. Go on. Be diligent in these matters. Don't be lazy. Don't stop. Renew your energy. This is what Paul is telling to us. Give yourself wholly to them. Again, this is a repeating of what I've already said. So that everyone may see your progress. So what does that mean? You have an influence upon others. Your zeal calls other people to zeal. Or, or your declaration of faith and your willingness to serve will do. You know, some of the people that have marked our life the most, sometimes they were on the hospital bed or they were uh, maybe dying or something. You know, uh, Jacob, uh, Joseph, Isaac, of the three of them in Hebrew chapter 11, they were on their deathbed. They were prophesying to their children for the future. They were seeing into the future. Uh, they had a faith, and Paul is commending their faith by giving us to read about, about that. So, be diligent in these matters. Give yourself only to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life. Do you watch your life? Have you witnessed lately? Have you talked about uh, Jesus to someone? Have you confessed your faith? Have you declared your faith recently? W what has come out of your mouth the most recently? Complain? Criticism? A declaration of faith, gospel-centered words, words of grace and encouragement. What comes out of your mouth? Watch your life. Watch your doctrines. Watch what you believe. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your ears. 
there's another generation, there's another group. Whatever you see, you will save them also. You will be an influencer. I told you that I would come back on the topic of influencers. I researched on Christian influencers just these last few weeks. And what I found really encouraged me. Uh, I want to share some of it with you. Many believe that uh, people nowadays are not interested in God. But actually, it's not true. Um, in my hometown in Quebec, I've been evangelism, uh, evangelizing in the street, uh, having a kiosk on the street, and times when the stores go on the street, the street is closed and they want to sell their products. We went there and we set up there. And we had some of these most wonderful conversations. In some of the people, they gave a, a thumbs up. And some of them told us, wow, it's so great that you are here to, to, to share about the, this faith. Uh, we went into a shopping malls uh, with an expo Bible that we are setting up in our hometown with some artifacts of the Bible. We went to an agricultural fair in our hometown and people would stop by. We had good conversations with, with people. They want to hear it, but in the good way, with love and clarity, and sharing your testimony, why you believe, these kind of things. So it is religion that they are not interested in. The institutions and the politics and, and what they have seen and heard that is not pleasant and that turns them away. But it is up to us to pray and ask the Holy Spirit, give us some creativity, give us some ideas that we can share. The Spirit works in every generation. This, we must be convinced of that. And he might be doing things that are very different. And you would say, oh no, I, this is... No, this is not from God, because in our times, we didn't do it this way. No, the, he will use a younger generation to reach a younger generation, sometimes with amazing, <laughs> amazing new ways. Um, I came on a TikTok media creator, uh, a young lady, very famous, I'm the J, that's her TikTok name. Uh, she's a creator, media creator. She has on the platform 5.4 million followers. That's a lot of followers. That shows you the power of, that the young generations may have. There are many of these people that will never enter into a church. Recently, she converted to Jesus and a real conversion uh, to, to come with that. And she started spreading her faith on her platform. So I'm closing and saying that God has not finished with our generation. I am convinced that God has many influencers in our midst. Right here, this morning, in our church. The Holy Spirit is at work in your life. He wants to do more. He's calling you to be an influencer. He wants to demonstrate through you His character. He wants to make you more conform like the likeness of His Son, uh, Jesus Christ. So even in the midst of your daily task, like the normal routine of life, or in the midst of your crisis or your setback, you went through a lot lately. You went through a lot during the pandemic. We can all be influencers. You know, so another uh, modern term that we have learned about in the last few years is life coach. Um, and well, what, is, what is that? Is that people who are trusting other people to help them navigate the difficult moment of their life, help them out to stay in shape, help them to live a healthy lifestyle, help them to maintain a positive uh, uh, mind. So you can be a life coach. When you imagine, when you go through this crisis, your life just came abruptly to a stop. And you, you, you don't know, you are desperate, you don't know where to turn. You are, it seems that you are out of resources. The Holy Spirit is with you. The, the Lord is my shepherd. He will lead you to the quiet waters. He will restore your soul. He will do something with you. He will feed you. He will lead you. And He will help you to, through that crisis, 
to become a life coach for others. He will do these kind of things throughout. And another term, terminology for that is like uh, maybe more biblical than all the other terminology I'm using, a witness of the grace of God. How much the grace of God is available in all of the difficult things that, that we go through. When we become impatient, when we become desperate, when we, we don't know what to do, the grace of God is overabundant. So this is, this is for you this morning. Expect the grace of God to overflow over your crisis this morning. Father God, thank you this morning for the word of certainties that you are giving to us. Lord, I pray specifically for those here in Lighthouse, in, in your church worldwide as well, that are going through tremendous crisis at the moment. They, 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 they are scared. They have doubts. They're questioning their life, their future. They don't know a lot about things, how they are going to come, come through this, this, this sets of setbacks and crises. Lord, I pray that you will reveal yourself to them, that you will touch their lives this morning, that you will create a, a sense of peace and, and a certainty in their life, certainty of the presence, of your presence, of your grace, that your grace will be overflowing over their life. Lord, reveal to your children alcohol. Reassure your people how much you love us. In the name of Jesus, amen. May God bless you abundantly. We love you and we regret and we cry that we cannot be with you, but God bless you so much. Let's keep contact through social media sometimes and God bless you.